you guys, this is the part of the notes for 1-3, so if you open your packet to this page, you can always stop to um, and pause the recording and go get your notes. We're going to be evaluating limits analytically. We've already done quite a few of them numerically and graphically, and analytically is kind of more with maybe an algebraic approach, maybe, might be a good way to say it. Um, and you can use, the key to it is, and you, some of you have discovered that already and did a little bit of it last year, but you can use direct substitution to evaluate many limits, not all limits, but many limits can be done with direct substitution. Um, in particular, when we talk about constants and linear um, and polynomials, there's some rules that apply, so I'm going to put them down the way the book gives them, but then I think I'm going to explain them a little differently for you. Um, when you have a function that's a constant, uh, maybe we'll call it a constant of b, what that means is the function itself is constantly the same thing. Uh, let's say maybe the limit as x approaches 2 of the constant 5. Remember, this is f of x, so that's the y value, and it's constantly 5, so if you think of it graphically, it looked like this. So it doesn't really matter what I'm approaching here because everywhere on that line, when I approach from the left and from the right, I'm always at 5. So this one actually always says that the limit as x approaches some c of a constant is the constant itself. And this looks kind of weird, but it's pretty intuitive when you look at it graphically. So a couple approaches. And likewise um, with the line, when we take your linear function, and the limit as x approaches some number of, let's just do x to the first. And that's pretty intuitive also because, let's go throw that on here. Let's say the limit as x approaches maybe 3 of x. Remember, this is my function. It's a line that looks like that. So as I approach maybe 3, right? I get what happens when I plug 3 into the function. So really what happens is I just plug this in and I get 3. So this is what it'll say in your book. And again, they look way more intimidating. It really is just kind of a direct substitution. Um, and lastly, for polynomials, the limit as x approaches some constant of a polynomial, like x to the fifth or x to the fourth again, those are going to be kind of your curving functions. It's direct substitution. And I'm not going to show you that one graphically. Those are pretty intuitive. And then there's a bunch of um, properties that go with it. And they look so confusing with all these c's and f of x's and all of that. But the first one just says that if you have a constant in here times the function, you can bring it out front and just say it's b times the limit as x approaches c of the function. Well, if I define it up here like they do in the book as being L, it just means multiply the limit. You might be saying, I don't, I don't get what that means. It means this. If you have the limit of 2x as x approaches, who cares, 5, you can bring that out front. You probably, you don't even need to. It's just going to be 2 times 5, it's 10. So these aren't, I'm going to go through them very quickly because once you apply them, it's really easy. Again, when you're adding two functions that have two separate limits up here, like L and K, or even if you're subtracting them, you can just add and subtract your limits. Same with multiplication. Same with division. Just with the division, again, if you watch that denominator, your K cannot be equal to zero. And lastly, I'm saying here, my limit of f of x is l, and I'm taking it to the nth degree, I get l to the nth degree. And you might be saying that this looks like crazy stuff, but <laughs> I'm going to take it out of all its ugliness and kind of combine a couple of them together. All it's saying is if you have some function, um, let's say x squared plus 3x plus 1, and again, I've got some addition in here, I've got a constant right here, the whole bit, you really could break it apart. And let's say x is approaching 2. Really what this is saying is you can break all this addition apart and say x is approaching 2 of x squared plus limit x approaches 2 of 3x plus limit x approaches 2 of 1. And then they say you can bring um, 
you can bring your constant out front here, and you can just plug this in, and it looks like a mess, but honestly, end result, you can just plug this in for X, and whatever you get is going to be your limit. So you, you're really applying a bunch of rules, but the end result is you're substituting it into the function. And if that worked all the time, life would be easy, but, but it doesn't. It does work. Let's go ahead up here and write it. It does work for all polynomial functions, so that's nice. Any polynomial function, you know, 4x squared plus 3x plus 1 or x to the fifth minus 2, it's going to work. Direct substitution is always going to work. It does work for all rational functions, and I got it. it's actually not all rational functions. It works for all of them with non, and this is important, so write it big. <laughs> Zero, you got to watch out for that all the time. We've been talking about it. Non zero denominators. So watch out for that. And if you don't know what a rational function is, it's just a polynomial function over another. Sorry, that's x polynomial function. And you just got to watch out that the bottom is not zero. Um, so always try direct substitution first and then be careful. We can't have a zero over zero pop out. We can't have a zero on a denominator. We can't be written any negative. So keep those little rules in mind. But if you do direct substitution and out pops a four, your limit's four. All right? So let's take a look at this one. Upon looking at direct substitution, you know, we've already talked a little bit about here. i got a problem at negative one, but I'm not approaching negative one here. I'm approaching positive 1, so I always try direct substitution first. Just go put in that 1, and I get 2 times 1 squared, which is 2, plus 1, plus 1. I've got a 4 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. Well, my limit's 2. It's as easy as that, as long as you don't have this indeterminate form, this 0 on the bottom, and kind of keep a little bit of an eye out for that. This is going to be a huge problem for us later. But again, if you just plug that in, again, I know I've got a problem when I'm writing negatives here, but I'm not. I'm going to have 9 minus negative 1 squared is just 9 minus 1. I'm going to have the square root 8 or 2 root 2, and I'm done. So try direct substitution, and if you get a nice number like that, life is good. And it says on the bottom, we're going to confirm it. We're going to confirm this first one up here numerically and graphically, just so you can see it, because I hate to say plug it in, it works. So let's go take a look at it. We're going to be approaching 1. So if I were to look at it numerically with the table, let's go plop a table down here, and I'm going to approach 1, and I'm going to go ahead and see what happens when I'm at maybe 1.001, 1. 1. 01, 1. 1.1, you guys have made a bunch of these in your homework and probably don't like them very much, and neither do I. I like the other approaches much better. When you do, go do it on your calculator, this ends up being about 1.85, this ends up being like 1.985, this one ends up being like 1.9999. Then when I start creeping in here from the right hand side, this is 2.0005, etc., etc. And you can see how these numbers numerically are collapsing in at that 2 that we got with direct substitution up there. More importantly is the graph of it. Okay? Um, I'm going to do it over in this space over here. More importantly is understanding what your graph is going to look like. When you graph that one, 2x squared plus x plus 1 on your calculator, actually I think I have that going on another page, so I'm going to move ahead here. Now also, the sine functions, your book's going to give you six different little rules, but they all say the same thing. They say the sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, as x approaches some constant, I'm sorry, <laughs> the limit, as x approaches some constant of the sine, cosine, tangent, is just the value of the trig function at that constant. You can basically, again, you can just substitute it in, as long as, watch out for this, watch out for dividing by zero. So let's check it out. Sine pi over two. The y at pi over two is a one. So the limit, just a one, and I'm done. Next one up, the limit of x cosine x. Again, I'm doing this limit, I can break it up, 
and use my properties if I want of x, and I've got my limit as x approaches pi of cosine x, product property I put on the other page. Um, as I approach a constant, I am that constant, okay? And when I put pi in here and I do the cosine of pi, x value right here is a negative 1. So I get pi times negative 1 or negative 1. And you could have put it right in here too, to be honest with you. You didn't have to break it up. You could have just plugged in the pi times cosine pi and that's negative 1. But your book's going to show this process of kind of laying out all the properties. Um, the next one, again you can do this with all your trig functions as long as you don't end up getting some funky thing like this that's not going to be allowed. But I can write this one as limit cosine x as x approaches 0 times the limit. Again I can break it up, cosine squared is cosine times cosine. And when I plug in a 0, again my cosine at 0 would be over here and it's the x value so I'm going to get a 1 times a 1 which is 1. So very straightforward substitution. Now here's where we have a problem. I said substitution's great. You should always try it first. But when it results in this, remember we talked in class about how this is called an indeterminate form. You might be thinking, oh, it's 1 because it's the same thing over itself. Or, oh, it's undefined because there's a 0 on the denominator. That's infinity because there's an infinite amount of zeros in 0. It's really what we call an indeterminate form. We can't determine what it is. It's not 0. It's not 1. It's not infinity. And we don't know what it is. Right? It can't be determined. So we got a problem when that happens down here. So there's some good things that you can try. Okay? And the first thing to do when you get an indeterminate form doesn't mean we can't figure out the limit. It just means direct substitution is going to fail. So a good thing to try is to factor and simplify. And if they factor and you get things to simplify, you might be able to work it on out. The other one is if there's a square root involved, okay, we're going to try multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate. And we'll talk about conjugates here in a second in case you forgot what they are. So down on the bottom with the examples, and I, it looks like I've got about two minutes left on this. I'm going to move it up here. Whoops, grabbed it. Hopefully I can get through a couple of the factoring ones anyway so we can get a good start on those. Down on the bottom here, when I go and I try my direct substitution with a 5, I end up with 25 minus 15 minus 10, which is 0. And on the bottom with a 5, oh, oh, can't have it. So the first thing I'm going to do here is try to factor it. And you'll note the top factors, this is why I said you got to be good at your factoring, your top factors into x minus 5 times x plus 2, and your bottom is x minus 5. And you'll notice I get these to cancel. We talked about what that meant a, a few days ago ahead of its time, and I said graphically that causes what we call a hole in the graph. And later we're going to even give another term for what happens there. But the direct substitution gave me this indeterminate form, so I'm taking another route. And really what that means is the graph of this agrees with the graph of x plus 2 everywhere but when it's 5. So I'm going to go up here and say really it, it's a it, oh, there we go. I, I've got it really it's going to be a line. We talked about that with a hole where x is 5. So it agrees everywhere so there's going to be a limit here of 7. And we're going to put it graphically in class tomorrow so you can see that being backed up. Same here. I've got a problem when I put in 1. I get 0 over 0. Can't have it. So what I'm going to do is try to get rid of that x minus 1 on the bottom with some factoring. So I'm going faster. I have 30 seconds. So I've got my difference of cubes there. x minus 1 times x squared plus 1 times x plus 1. This is why I told you you had to be good at factoring those differences of cubes. And I'm taking my limit. You shouldn't drop your limits until you substitute in. And I'm going to notice this cancels. This is helpful for me. What that means is there's a hole in the graph there, but the graph of this function agrees with this one everywhere, except there's a hole. 
Okay? I'm just going to, I'm not making the exact one, but there's a hole there 